getting the partnership structure in place at the beginning, having good alignment as to how you plan to grow and how much time you plan to commit goes a long way. As you know, businesses do one of three things. They either do really well, they just kind of go flat or they do really poorly. And in those really well and really poorly scenarios, you want to make sure you have a clear understanding as to how your partnership is going to work. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. And today, our guests, they moved from zero, no money. I mean, no money. It's all of a sudden, I mean, it's not all of a sudden, but over a decade. But now they have 2,500 employees, over 4,000 units or, or beds, they call it in there, in senior living, right? That's, that's their asset class. They're in 10 states. And we're going to go in a little deeper with this uh, guest, and we're going to do a couple shows with them. Man, we're going to talk about how they did that, right? And, and I feel like it doesn't matter what asset class you're in, you're going to learn a lot from our guest today, Adam Benton. Adam is the Senior Vice President of Seller Senior Living. He was recognized nationally by Argentum, the leading industry association, with a 40 under 40 award for leadership. He served for three years on the Utah Alzheimer's Association Board of Advocate for Seniors with Dementia, raise awareness for the disease, and fund research. But he and his family, his father and brother-in-law, they started this 10 years ago. And you're going to hear about their growth today. And then in another show, we're going to follow up and hear more details about how they raise money for different, you know, for different assets as they grew. Uh, man, they've grown a lot, right? And it didn't start that way in the beginning. You're going to hear about different systems, processes that they started with and ones that they use today. And then in another show, we're going to get into them raising money and growing their business and then what they expect the future to look like for their business and, and just our market in general. Adam, pleasure to meet you. Honored to have you on the show. Uh, just talking to you before we got started. I mean, you started a business a decade ago, and I mean, there's so many things that we're going to learn from you today. I have no doubt. There's many lessons that have to be learned in starting a business and keeping it going that long and scaling and growing. And even in your specific niche as well, I want to learn more about that. But tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and so we can dive in. Yeah, you bet. And Whitney, thank you for having me on your show. So, yeah, so I'm Adam Benton. I'm, I'm in senior housing. So, about a decade ago, I started this business with my brother and my dad, actually, so three of us. And we started it with no money. And we basically started looking around trying to buy uh, senior housing assets. I found four after cold calling for about a summer. And at that point, they were in a few different states. We then uh, reached out to a, a real estate investment trust, right? A REIT that agreed to basically purchase those and lease them back to us. So our first assets, we actually purchased through a REIT, and then we leased them back. And then to make sure that we had enough money, we actually negotiated to have that payment for the lease payment in arrears. So at the end of the month. So it actually created a little bit of a float right at the beginning. And that's just how we started. So over the last 10 years, we've continued to grow in senior housing. We're based out of Salt Lake City. And with those four, four we're now at 30 locations in 10 different states. Uh, we have about 2,500 employees and about 4,000 beds related to independent living, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing. So I've just been living, breathing, drinking senior housing for the last 10 years. And I've learned a lot in the process of, of scaling a business from zero to where we're at today, as well as just some of the benefits of being in this portion of the industry. 10 states. Is that right? You said you're in 10 different yeah. states, 2,500 employees, 4,000 beds. I mean, that's no small feat. You definitely you know, we're napping too much. <laughs> yeah. Making that happen, right? I mean, it's so impressive. So I appreciate you sharing the color a little bit of it, man. This is where we've grown because it's very impressive. And I know there's lessons there that, man, it doesn't matter what asset class we're in that, you know, we can learn a lot from your growth. So I wanted to back up a little bit. You know, you started a decade ago with your father, your brother, and with no money, right? And so I just, I love stories like that because, you know, you made it happen. Right, you made it happen. You know, you put the time in, the, the work in. You started cold calling, but you mentioned that you connected with a REIT and they like made the first purchases for you, or you know, you connected with them. Can you share a little bit about maybe how that worked or what that looked like, and why would a REIT, you know, why did they consider working with you with no experience? Sure. So we did have experience in space, so I should say that, right? And so we had experience before. I think coming just cold and no experience and saying, let's buy $40,000, $40 million worth of real estate is a tough ask. But the REITs have a few things that they want to get accomplished. One is 
I mean, you know, their goal is to continue to buy a diversified set of assets. And then those assets have to cash flow to be able to create earnings for the, their investors. Now, REITs can be private or public. In our case, there's a public REIT. And so those earnings get distributed through dividends. They want quality assets and then they want uh, quality operators. So what we said is, look, we found these assets. So we actually were in control of that. And that's an important piece is that is we did rolled up our sleeves to actually find assets in which we controlled the purchase process. So if they wanted those assets, they had to work with us. So that's something that you've always got to remember in real estate. And I think it's a key piece is that there's usually some sort of puzzle piece that helps you control the deal, whether it's owning the land, saying that you're going to guarantee it, or in this case, finding something that you've actually locked up in a contract that allows you to get an outsized negotiating presence, right? And so we found those first four assets, the REIT wanted to buy those, and then we just negotiated an agreement in which we would lease it. Now, they still had to have confidence in our ability to then continue to operate those, but it wasn't easy. And when I say we started from scratch, like we had no policies or procedures or anything. And so when somebody would call and ask for, hey, what does that form look like? Go great, give me like 30 minutes, you know, I uh, go make the form, send it out. Does that look right? So those are the kind of things that we really had to hustle at. And you're just working a ton. But over time, you just what's difficult gets easier. And as you continue to grow the platform, you can bring on more team members to help you out. But yeah, I mean, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but partnering with a REIT at the start was a very good way to start. We now, of those 30 assets, we have various partnerships in different structures. The lease structure, like at the beginning, we have some that we own outright through the cash flow of our own business. We have some in which we just do joint ventures where we might be the GP and then we have LPs and we have a promote. And then lastly, we have just third-party management stuff where somebody else owns it, they're looking for an operator and we've gotten good enough in which we can step in and operate for a fee. So that's how it looks like today. Yeah, no, that's incredible. I appreciate you sharing that because I know a lot of people are wondering, well, would that be beneficial for me to start or to using a REIT, right? Should I reach out to a REIT? And maybe you can talk about that. How did you reach out to a REIT? How did you all even think through, well, is this a good option for us? You know, and maybe, you know, so the listener can be thinking, should they try to do the same thing as they're getting started or maybe as they're trying to scale to a larger asset or something like that? Sure. So REITs are a great way to go, especially if you're starting. And for a couple of reasons, if you think about it, there's a few different types of REITs and there's REITs in every asset class within real estate. Now, a REIT technically can't operate their own real estate. So they're always looking for a partner to operate for them. They are mainly a holder of the, um, op- of the uh, prop code, the, the property portion of the business. And then they have some rules and regulations around distributing the majority of the income from earnings to investors. So public REITs, there's many of those. That's a little bit more difficult to get into, but there's also private REITs that are all over the place that are looking for people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and do a good job. And that can be in any space that you're interested in investing within real estate. So when you think about a REIT, the cleanest structure that REITs typically like to do, is they like to purchase an asset, 100% of it, and then lease it back to you. In our case, it's uh, let's say we bought something for $10 million. The easy math would just be to think that the lease rate is going to be maybe six to eight percent of that per year. So six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars in which you have to pay to the REIT in a lease format. So as long as your real estate, you're confident it can basically cover that amount plus some, then you have a good investment. And then those lease terms typically go for five, 10, 15, 25. In our case, it was 15 year initial with two 10 year extensions. So it's a 35 year lease. So I'll be in my late 60s by the time those first four leases expire. And in our instance, we bought something that actually had a little bit of a turnaround requirement. So lower occupancy, maybe had some deferred maintenance, and we could come in with carpet, paint, lighting, maybe change a wing. But the end result is that we're able to create higher performance than where our lease was lease rate was at. And then that created just a gap in cash flow, which allowed us to then start reinvesting. So that's the benefit of a REIT, you get some of the advantages of real estate ownership. You don't get all of them, but you do to get many of them um, related to that start. Biggest key is that many times you can come in with either just a small deposit or not even the deposit, just signing a guarantee on that lease. 
I don't know. Did I answer the question? I hope I know it's a big world there. On that. No, that's great. No, that's awesome, Adam. I know I get a lot of questions about groups that are wanting to or thinking about partnering with a REIT and don't know if that's something they should do or not. So I know that helps add a little color to maybe some things they should consider. I loved how you you, know, you talked about you know negotiating to have control in the deal and some things they should consider, like even the long leases, right? You know and how that right. process. That's, you said you'll be in your sixties, I think, before those leases are up. So that's something to consider, right? I mean that. You know, you don't look that old to me. So that it's seems a like commitment. a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is a commitment, no doubt. Well, speak to, you know, the maybe the partnership too with your father, your brother, how the team started to grow in the beginning. What did that look like as you all started to scale and uh, to purchase new deals and, and started to build out a team? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, in every partnership, if you don't do it, I'd highly recommend an operating agreement, right? I mean, that's an obvious step, but I've been amazed how many times people skip that step. That's basically like a prenuptial, right? Before you get married in business. And it just helps you set the terms. So even though I was working with my dad and my brother-in-law, we created a pretty clear operating agreement. So that outlines things like voting rights on big and small decisions, as well as how much time you expect to work in the business or what happens if you have losses. So those kind of contracts can go a long way into setting you up for success. That also helps you get an agreement as to what are your goals as a partnership. So in our case, our goal was to continue to grow to be where we're at today. If you looked at our business plan, which I put together, it's a really simple spreadsheet. We just thought, hey, if you just add two to four properties a year, right? In 10 years, you'll be at 30 properties. And that's literally what happened. And today we're at 30. So we averaged three properties a year. So you hear a lot, it takes a decade to become an overnight success. Right? So we're still got a long way to go, but it's literally been a decade. And so in that process, when we first started, we just found a Regis office center. And there was just a few of us and we were still trying to complete this first deal. There was just three of us in there. And we worked pretty hard to get that done. And so getting the partnership structure in place at the beginning, having good alignment as to how you plan to grow and how much time you plan to commit goes a long way. As you know, businesses do one of three things. They either do really well, they just kind of go flat or they do really poorly. And in those really well and really poorly scenarios, you want to make sure you have a clear understanding as to how your partnership is going to work. Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because it seems odd. Well, wait a minute. You know, this is your family. Do you really need something like that? You know, I can just hear those questions often, right? Or, or why, why you may not do that type of thing. Well, it's just, it's our family. I trust my father or, you know, my brother-in-law, right? But man, I would often say that's even more of a reason to have this stuff written out, right? Yeah, it's important. And it's some hard decisions maybe in the beginning. You know, has that changed though? Maybe you all thought, you know, this should be in the operating agreement in the beginning, or maybe your brother in law is going to be doing these things or in charge of these things or your father. But then you all figured out, let's say a year or two years in that, hey, I'm really better at this thing over here or passionate about this other part of the business. You know, did that change at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And as you can imagine, as the business grows, the hats that you wear change uh, so that you do have to have some level of flexibility. It's very difficult to anticipate exactly what opportunities will come your way and how that will look. But you still can say, Hey, we want to devote at least 95% of our time towards full-time work within this specific business. Now, what you actually do can change over time. So at the very beginning, I was very much focused on operating, right? And so lots of employees in our business. And so just learning the ropes, setting things up, systems. But over time, I've now shifted more into like a chief investment officer role. So that's looking for and buying existing assets, divesting of assets as needed, refinancing. All of those types of needs start start becoming bigger as you grow. And so you tend to hire other people to help out and probably do better than you, quite frankly, it's at certain roles. So it has definitely changed over time. Sometimes our strategy has changed a little bit. As you know, I mentioned at the beginning, our strategy was leases. And then we started moving more and more towards, towards joint ventures. And at year nine, we did our first friends and family race. So we kind of went a little bit backwards in that sense, but we have changed uh, how we structure those partnerships and you still as we've moved forward. Nice. And I appreciate the color on how your position has changed. And so speak to some of the systems though, in the very beginning that have helped you all to scale like this and, and maybe, you know, the newer operator and maybe even the experienced operator that's listening, you know, we always wonder, man, how can I improve the system? Right. I always tell my team, man, we got to document the system so we can continue to improve it. Right. It's, it's never something that's like finished. I feel like any system almost, but what were some of the early systems that, man, you know, helped you all to get to where you're at now? 
Sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So if you looked at our early set of systems, we have ripped out almost every one of those and had to redo them over time. So what we use today is very different than what we used at the beginning. But one thing that I've learned is that we would first, you just do a Google search, you look up all the systems that are in that space, demo way more than you think you should. That's step one. And then you go talk to somebody who uses every one of those systems and you'll find people that say, oh, I switched from one system to another and you'll get the real feedback. And then when you actually roll it out, you find that you might get 50% of what the demo actually showed you in terms of bells and whistles to actually get the job done. Some of the systems that are core... We use today, we use Yardi. Yardi is a very common multifamily product that they have a senior house component to it. Before that, we used MRI, which is also an apartment building. And then before that, we used a system called um, Right Click, which was bought by a group called Matrix Care. That's your core financial system. But we also have a payroll system. We have a, you know, a medical record system. We have a system just related to spending. So we have a CRM. One of the systems that I think that I love today that we use that we bought last year related to friends and family was just one of these syndication systems. So we use Juniper Square and it is awesome. I don't know how people would raise from like 50 investors with like 15 years ago. I have no idea how they do that. So something like that, where there's just an off the shelf solution that would do way better than you could do and make you look way more professional and keep you way more organized has just gone a long way to take a small team to accomplish a fair amount in a system. So we use tons of systems and we typically look to invest and try out systems. And we're not afraid to do that. So we'll try something out. If it doesn't work, we'll rip it out. So we have a couple of things just related to our industry that's like a co-star type of thing where you're just analyzing markets and finding stuff that looks expensive on the upfront. It might be fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year, which is an eye-popping amount of money for a system that just helps you analyze stuff but it will pay for itself in a pretty good ROI if you're using it properly. So systems is something we believe in, you know, it's people, product, process, that product, process piece is systems. So I can't talk enough about systems. Yeah, that's awesome. What CRM do you all use? Well, we have a couple. We started out using, let's see, the very first was actually Zoho. Okay. Which is just a, it's a, that you can get a CRM Zoho for free. We currently use a senior housing specific uh, CRM called Welcome Home. Okay. Now that's awesome. And it, it is one of those things. It's like, there's so many to choose from. The most important thing is that you have one and that you use it. Right? You use it. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Got to use it. And so I appreciate the other things too, like Yardi, Juniper Square. I've heard good things about them. We use Investnext, similar you know product, which we can't recommend enough either. But yeah, I don't know how people did it years ago either with that. I mean, I cannot imagine the mailing the documents back and forth and oh my goodness, you know, but right. something like that is just crucial. And you hit the nail on the head, I think too, and you say, man, it just gives you a, a professional presence, right? Your investors have a portal, they can log in, you know, it just gives them the security, the feel of security anyway, you know, and just the ease of the process of completing documents and all those things. So, you know, thinking about, you know, you all scaling and thinking about, you know, to where you're at now, tell us about some of the bigger hurdles that you all had to get through. I mean, to go from, you know, that first deal or so, and you're working with the REIT to, I mean, 2,500 employees. I mean, that's significant, right? I mean, that's a lot of people sure. that you're employing. I mean, that you're caring for, that you're ensuring they have a great job to come to every day, right? And culture that you're creating and all those things. And so massive growth, personal growth for you, no doubt, to make that happen. But speak to some of the hurdles that it took to go from zero, no money, right, to 2,500 employees, 4,000 beds. You know, if you go back, you know, and say, okay, these three things happen, whatever, what would those be? Sure. I think the first thing is that it seems daunting today to say, hey, you have to set up all these systems and be able to pay people and pay vendors and all that. It's a little bit easier than you think for a lot of reasons. One is it's day by day. You don't have to ever think perfect every day. And so that's something that I'd probably remember right off the bat is that there's a lot of things, especially when you're smaller, you can just do do by hand that isn't a big deal until you get to a certain size and then it becomes a big enough friction that it's going to cost you a lot of money and time and that you probably got to think about systems and people to put around that process. I think the very first thing that I didn't fully appreciate at the beginning is just that those very first couple deals are pretty critical to getting correct. And so spending an extra level of time and effort into finding the right deal, sourcing it, underwriting it, and just making sure it's fully correct. That goes a long way. Now, now one thing that I didn't fully appreciate at the beginning was 
that even though you might say, well, I don't know exactly, I'm just starting out. How would I know what the best deal looks like? There are a lot of other people that are interested in making sure that these deals succeed. If you end up getting debt on it in any way, a bank is going to go through and do a similar analysis to make sure that your numbers make sense, right? You can also lean on other people that you know in the industry to just say, hey, can you just review this? If you end up not actually doing your own manage it and management and you hire out a manager, like a you buy a multifamily property and you hire a manager, they can go through and do their own analysis on that deal. So getting the deal right at the very beginning is very important, but you can also lean on people around you that can just help verify your business plan. I would heavily do that. And they're invested in making sure that it's successful as well. And that'll save you a lot of headache and get you onto a good footing. You can make mistakes later. Just don't make them at the beginning. That's what I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Did you all have mentors? Did you all hire a mentor? Who was that for you all? You know, maybe not them specifically, but how did you find that person? You know, and how did they speak into you to help ensure those first few were correct or were good? Sure. So like I said, we had some experience in the space. So let's see. So I went to undergrad for finance. I then went and worked on Wall Street for about five years. I did a master's in finance. I had a lot of educational experience related to that. I had emphasis in real estate. But my father had a lot of experience in this space, specifically in real estate. So he was tremendously helpful in helping avoid some of those landmines. Now, in that point, I've been pretty lucky. So we started when I was 30. I'm now 40. But I've seen many people who find a mentor, either in a partner or somebody else who's doing a similar business, and it has a similar effect. And so I think the main key, though, is having a mentor can go a long way in helping save you a lot of headache and trouble. And then just to give you an example, even though I did an undergrad and a master's and worked in finance, when we went out to raise friends and family money, I knew almost zero about that. So what did I do? I just went on to Amazon and I bought three books related to raising money and I read them all. And that was a year ago, right? So even though you think you've just been at this a long time, you can always learn more and it won't cost you the cost of $150,000 or $200,000 MBA or even an undergrad. The information is out there. So podcasts like yours just go a long way in just helping understand what's out there and how to avoid things and how to learn stuff. And then you can always just grab a couple of books. I've also done a couple of specific real estate investment online courses that have taught me way more than anything I ever learned in my undergrad or master's. So I can't emphasize education enough and it's cheaper than you think as long as you want to put in the time and then just finding a mentor or two that that are willing to help. And people are always willing to help. Uh, with starting this or even partner with you on it. So that's my thought around just mentorship and partnering. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned online courses. I don't hear that too often. There are, is there one that you can recommend quickly? Yeah. The one that I like is called Adventures in Real Estate. It's called Adventures in Commercial Real Estate, Adventures in CRE. And if you look that one up, I think it's a completely reasonable course. And it is a boot camp related to actually doing underwriting And then the models that they have on their website, we still use many of those today to help in our business with waterfall structures or structures related to just understanding debt. They have it for every real estate asset class. That's been very helpful in saving time and just getting smart really quickly in the real estate space. That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. I know a lot of listeners wonder you know, how people educated themselves early on. And, and so that's so helpful. I want the listener to know right now as well that Adam and I are going to do a, a series of shows. We're going to do another show, at least one more, maybe two. But we're going to go into some of those ways that they raise money in the beginning to how they're raising money now, how, you know, through different assets and how that grew and even his opinion on, on what the future looks like and, you know, in their asset class, but maybe just in real estate in general. I love asking that and talking that, especially to guys like him who have been in the business for a number of years now and are watching these things closely. No doubt they're tracking these things. I mean, you've got 2,500 employees, 4,000 bids. You need to know what's happening in the market, right? And you need to be able to predict things. And so I'm looking forward to that discussion myself as well, Adam. And so we're going to end this segment here. And But I want the listeners to know, hey, you know, we're going to follow up with Adam and we're going to learn a lot from him over the next day or so. All right. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks for your time today. And I look forward to more discussions. Uh, Adam, why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners that where they can find you so that find you today? So you can find me on LinkedIn, Adam Benton. Our company is called Stellar Senior Living. I'm happy to connect. And then our website's just stellarliving.com. 
And we do have an investor portal. If you just fill in that information and send it, I'm happy to set up a call and just talk to you a little bit more individually. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become. We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today.